Here's what worries me about Kenny Pickett. His biggest year was his last year. He had a turnover problem in college. I'm not obsessed with hand size, but it was a Jared Goff issue, and he had a problem securing the football. Kenny has a hand size issue. Um, I think he is big enough, athletic enough, uh, not a huge arm, not a big plus-plus arm, but I do worry that by the end of his college career, you know, he's like a 23-year-old, 24-year-old kid playing with a lot of 20-year-olds, and, and I, I, I don't see a lot of it. I see capable. Is that fair? Uh, no, I think it's a little unfair because uh, what happened was he got a really good receiver his last year at Pitt. And, and he connected with that guy. And, and he got better coaching. Uh, he, he got a, a more pro-style approach to the game as opposed to uh, simply uh, uh, pure spread. And, and so everything fit together for him. Uh, so I wouldn't hold the, the previous years against him. He's, he's growing and developing, and he fulfills every, virtually every Bill Parcells axiom, which is you know, one of which is to, is, is to play 30 games. Right. Um, the arm strength is, is okay. It's not great, but it's okay. Uh, and, and, and that's all you need as long as you're accurate and you can process. And it looks as though he processes well. He's athletic enough to make plays with his feet uh, and to move out of the pocket and certainly to move within the pocket. And he's got, I, I, I don't believe that he lacks the it factor. I think he's got it. Um, he, he led Pitt from behind on a number of occasions this past okay. year. Uh, he, he beat a, a, a pretty good North Carolina team in the bowl game. Um, he, he's got the it factor, I think. So he's going to play. Um, you know, how good will he be? I think any quarterback's only as good as the people around him. I would point you to Alabama's young man last year, who many of the same pe people were saying the very same thing about. Who is the most successful rookie quarterback this year? The young man from Alabama. So, right. uh, you know, I, I think he'll play and, and, and be pretty good. When Josh Allen came in from Wyoming, uh, I had talked to somebody who said he made a mistake evaluating him. He said, I should have taken his greatest moments and, and considered those um, more than I did his overall play. Um, because when you watch his NFL career, it's, you see a lot of his greater moments. And those were sensational, but I didn't take into consideration. He, he wasn't as refined. Well, he was going to get better coaching in the pros so when i watch malik willis drives the ball big trunky thick athlete sounds like a good kid he may not have the most refined tape but there are moments on it that are wow how do you judge him the more raw prospect well first of all he's six feet tall and that that's worrisome short quarterbacks you know doug flutie and 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 Drew Brees are, are the exceptions, not the rule. So that, that, that's, that's difficult to begin with. Um, secondly, the arm strength part of it is, is, you know, it's good. It's good to have a strong arm, but that, that's not what wins in the league. It's processing and the ability to be accurate with the ball. Um, and now he comes in as a guy who essentially does – makes his living with his legs. He does spectacular things. My question is, can he do winning things? And those are two different categories. Right. Complete, two different completely categories. So I have questions there. I have questions there. Now, his coach, Hugh Freeze, to, to my knowledge, hasn't had any NFL experience, made a statement that I saw which says, he doesn't know what he doesn't know, meaning the young man doesn't yet know what he doesn't know. Um, and that's, that's true of every rookie quarterback. But the other thing you have to keep in mind is that he's making a big jump up in level of competition. L Liberty is below the level of the Mid-America. This isn't Ben Roethlisberger coming in here, you know, who's, right. who dominated the Mid-America. So um, there's that. Uh, so to me, there are some questions here 
And I think, but for the rookie salary cap and the fifth year option, I don't think I'd consider him as a first rounder. But because of the rookie cap and because of the fifth year option, he is probably worth taking a chance on. Because if you hit on him, you got him for f- four years at a low salary and five years at a reasonable salary. And if you if you don't hit, if he doesn't do well, then all you've lost is a first round draft choice. And that's and that's that's not insignificant, but it's not the end of the world. You know, Bill, there's we see this in all sports. There's rule changes, cultural changes in basketball. About 10 years ago, you could no longer have two players on the floor that couldn't shoot a three. And it changed swiftly. And the GMs that embraced it, Warriors Bob Myers won a lot of titles. A lot of teams did not embrace it, and they suffered the consequences. In baseball, there are just realities now about um, the kind of batters, power batters who strike out a lot is not, you know, the Dave Kingmans of my era would not be the liability they were, right? Uh, Today, that player, a lot of home runs, some strikeouts. What you don't want is ground balls. In the NFL, because of rule changes and some cultural changes, I'm noticing this for about the last 10 years in California. Kids are very good about trends, music trends, sports trends. They know them first. The money's at quarterback and wide receiver, and the rules now benefit both. You can't hit quarter receivers over the middle. Uh, they feel more empowered. Quarterback, similarly, very protected. In the state of California high school recruiting bill, if you go to the top 100 players in high school next year, 40 are receivers or quarterbacks, almost 50%. And so I look at these wide receiver contracts and, and I'm like, what in the hell is going on? But then I look at teams like the Bengals who have major issues on the O-line, major issues at linebacker. It doesn't matter. They're great at receiver and great at quarterback. I look at the Rams saying, we don't need first round picks. Get the quarterback right. We'll figure everything else out. It is when I saw Tyreek Hill go for five draft picks, I about fell out of my chair. But then I think to myself, geez, he's Cooper Cup with speed. You can use him like six different ways. What do you make of this very quickly evolving value and cost of wide receivers? Well, first of all, cost is entirely dependent on what the first guy in the marketplace does, because every other agent's going to jump over that by right. 500,000 or a million, however, however high they can go. So the first contract that gets signed is, is out of this world, and, and now everybody else is chasing that. And what happened, I think, with, with although I, I share your view of Tyreek, um, what happened with, with the, the Chiefs, I think, is that they said, you know, we need three receivers to make this go. Yeah. We, we can't have – they haven't won the Super Bowl with just two guys. <clears throat> Excuse me, Kelsey and, and, uh, and Tyreek. We need a third guy. And if we have to pay – Tyreek this money and Kelsey's approaching the back nine. In fact, he's probably playing 10 as we speak. Yeah. Um, where does that leave us? And, and so have they priced themselves out of certain markets? I think that's probably true. Um, now Tyreek Hill doesn't come along every day nor does right. Devante come along every day although they're two completely different types of receivers. So my hope is that that the market will 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 slow down and and only the top guys will get that incredible money. But you and I both know that's not how it works. <laughs> so you may be in a situation where you find yourself saying, um, okay, I can afford digs, but I can't afford two other receivers, I'm going to have to go with rookies in that situation. Now, the right. good part about that is, as you point out, there are plenty of rookies out there. Yeah. But that doesn't that doesn't make for the most outstanding and the most efficient football you can put on the field. You know, it's interesting. Uh, 
the the consensus among many in the media was you got to pay Debo Samuel. And I said a week ago, oh, time out, time out. He plays very physically. He's been hurt multiple times. Um, Shanahan, Kyle leans into that style of coaching. Uh, he loves Kittle. Debo Samuel, I said, I couldn't pay him huge money because then my top two players, Kittle and Debo, are injury prone. Where my primary rival in the division, the Rams, Jalen Ramsey's not injury prone. Aaron Donald's not. Matt Stafford's not. Bobby Wagner's not. Cooper Cup's not. I, I got to consider my division. I got to win my division, right? right? And the Rams stars are never hurt. Well, Garoppolo's hurt a lot. <laughs> Kittle, Debo Samuel. So my takeaway was I get the Niners saying, we're going to listen to offers. Um, is it ever difficult, Bill? You love a player. He just won your playoff game. He has incredible value. And you're going to get heat by a lot of people for not doing it. What do you do with a Debo Samuel? Man, oh, man. Is that, that is the ultimate dilemma for a GM. It's the ultimate really? dilemma. Yes. Because you love the player, the, the chances are you love him as a person too. The, the contribution he makes is unique. The, the attachment he has to the franchise and to the fans is also strong and unique. And his personality and style of play, along with the tight end, really says a lot about what that football team is. Yes. The backs are interchangeable. I mean, you right. can, they, they can bring backs off the street literally and play well in that system, but you got to have that, that, that great receiver and you got to have the great tight end. So how do you, how do you make that fit? What do you sacrifice? So when it, when it, when it all boils down, and we've had this discussion about what his value is. Then you say, okay, we know what his value is. It, it, it's what Devontae and, and Tyreek got. That's what he's going to be asking for. What do we have to sacrifice in order to accommodate that? That's where the dilemma comes in. And, and so you have to have a system of football on defense because the offense is where the, where the money is. You just pointed it out. You have to have a system of football on defense where you can feed young players, less expensive players into the equation. And the Rams are doing that. They let Reader go, right? Yep. He's playing for in the same building, but for a different team. Right. Uh, because they are not going to pay linebackers because they got to pay Cooper Cup at some point in time. Right. So the question is not, do we keep Debo or do we put him out on the market? I don't think he's fungible. The question is, what do we have to give up to accommodate what we're going to pay, pay him? And that's the dilemma. That's the one that keeps you up at night. <laughs> you know, it's a um, quarterback. Me, <laughs> yeah. Four o'clock in the morning, bolt upright in a bed. Holy mackerel. Oh, do <laughs> <laughs> Quarterbacks mean more than ever. They're more compensated than ever. They have more power and leverage than ever. And now many are demanding mobility. Um, it's a new time. It's almost a international soccer star feel, NBA superstar feel. Not quite there yet. But with the Aaron Rodgers situation, I mean, he called out the franchise. He's tried to humiliate the franchise. He's not going to show up to one of his camps, even though he, they may have young receivers they just drafted. He's not going to show up. He'll do talk shows, game shows. And I think to myself, boy, I almost wa wonder if Green Bay would be better with an owner who could get on the phone and bark at him a little bit and say, hey, pal, you know, but they don't have that in Green Bay. Um, the other day, Mark Murphy said he doesn't have a three-year contract. He's got three one-year contracts. And I thought, <laughs> I don't know if he's going to be there for three years. I mean, where is your line in the sand on not having leverage with a star, being publicly humiliated by a star, um, having um, him not being accommodating? I mean, some of this stuff I look at and think, man, I know he's talented, Bill, but this is a lot. I mean, you go out and take shots at the organization. You can do it with no owner, but it's a lot to deal with. I, I know, like Debo, he's talented, but how would you have handled this? Well, Mark is a Mark Murphy is a is a 
not only a very smart guy, but a former player. And so he understands the chemistry of the locker room. He understands what the what the trigger man does for you. He understands the 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 the, the dynamic that that guy brings to the team. And you know, there you, you stretch that rubber band as far as you can stretch it in order to win. Now, in Aaron's case, what's what's what was shocking to me was he had to know that Devontae was leaving. He did. He had to know it. And yet he still took the money, knowing that he was going to be bereft of his number one receiver. So that tells you, common sense tells you it had to be about the money. That's what it was about. Not get me a team, not let me put put my stamp on the offense, not let me bring Tommy Clements is as good as as good as Tommy is. Uh, but let me get my contract done here. So there's nothing wrong with that. Every player should do that. But to do it in a in a disruptive way is really stretching that rubber band. And now not showing up at minicamp after you've gotten all this money and the off-season program after you've gotten all this money, that one, uh, you know, even Mark probably – has a, has difficulty with that. As mature as he is, and as experienced as he is, as one of the people I respect most in this business, it's got to stick in his craw, and it would in mine. I mean, owner or no owner, I think I'd sit down and say, "Listen, we need to get some things straight here." Yeah, um, you know, Bill Belichick well competed against him for a long time. Um, I, I said the other day that. Um, I mean, every NFC team that went to the playoffs had an offensive coach. If you take out the AFC East, which has all defensive coaches, only one division had a coach win that wasn't an offensive coach, and that was Tennessee. And there's an argument to be made that Carson Wentz really messed it up, or they would have been a playoff team too um, in Indianapolis. And that a lot of these older defensive coaches, Pete Carroll's had – his defense is not as effective over the last four years. Uh, Vic Fangio got fired. Mike Zimmer struggled to get along with Kirk Cousins. Uh, Washington, Ron Rivera can't quite get it right. I'm not saying um, you have to be an offensive coach, but even with Belichick, they let Shaq Mason go, J.C. Jackson go. They have really no exceptional weapons on the perimeter. It's almost a starless franchise. I don't think. I'm not doubting Belichick's brilliance, but he said a few years ago, Bill, he said, I'm only going to coach the guys I want to coach. You know, got my, got my money, got my rings. I'm just going to coach the guys I want to coach. And I think to myself, well, be careful. <laughs> Sometimes those great players are a pain in the ass. I do look at them and think, boy, Bill, they don't have a lot of speed. They lost their best corner. They don't have an elite edge rusher. They got a young quarterback. I, I worry, not worry. I, I look at it and I think, you know, Greg Popovich started buying into his own system. Let's DeMar DeRozan go. Let's Kawhi Leonard go. They're not a very good team anymore. And he's still a brilliant coach. Do you see with New England, would you be concerned a little as a GM that, you know, when Bill says, I'm only coaching guys I want to coach. Well, Bill, that's not realistic. I'd love to work at a company where everybody's my best friend. It doesn't work that way. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't take that literally. I think he's he's got, I know he's got a, 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 a you know a broad level of tolerance for different personalities. And as Marv Levy used to say, don't confuse personality and character. You know, they're two different things. Um, so I, I I I don't think Bill's working in in a, in a narrow uh, in a narrow space. I think what he does want. Uh, is a team that will be team oriented. Uh, he remember Bill Parcells, his mentor said he never wanted a celebrity quarterback. Th there was no greater celebrity quarterback than Tom Brady. Right. And then <laughs> Cam he was, Newton. He went and got Cam Newton. Cam Newton. Yes, of course. Who, who couldn't carry Tom Brady's gym bag as a quarterback, right. but you know, was a personality for sure. The, the, 
so I think he wants people who will buy into the team logic uh, and the present quarterback is, is perfect for that. I mean, he's, he's absolutely exhibit a of that. Um, I do agree that the receiver position needs an upgrade in speed. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, the offensive line for years was left to the magic of Dante Scarnecchia. Now, Dante's still there as an advisor, but I think they've been through a couple of offensive line coaches, and it's hard to replicate Dante. He's He and Howard Mudd were really one of a kind. I mean, you know, two of a kind. Exceptional. Um, so Bill now has to worry about that to some degree. Which where he didn't have to do that before, um, so change. You know, there's change. Josh is gone now. Most people expected that that wouldn't happen; that he would succeed Bill, but he but he didn't. And so, it's it's a whole new ball game. But Bill Belichick knows how to win football games better than anybody else coaching in the National Football League. And I lost plenty to him. And, and won some too, you know, and, and, it, and it was a fierce rivalry. But when I was at ESPN along with you and, and, and doing the color on the radio games, I would go out and prepare for the game and then do the game and come back and say, he just outcoached the other guy. He, he, you know, he, he stole the other guy's wallet via special teams. You know, right. the, the guy is incredible. And he knows how to build football teams. The only move that they made that puzzled me was J.C. Jackson. That was the one that puzzled me because they don't have cap problems. And and if he's anything, Bill is a brilliant defensive genius, and especially one on the defensive uh, in the defensive back end. So the J.C. Jackson move puzzled me. But other than that, I don't question what he does, and I think he's still on top of his game. And, and to your central question, he's got a broad spectrum of people that he wants to coach. He's not into a narrow area. Just picking choir boys. That's not <laughs> – no one does that. And, he, and you can't win doing that. He knows that. Finally, all your years of being a general manager, Hall of Fame, what single player – that you drafted, any round are you proudest of? Maybe your scout said, Bill, I don't know. Maybe you did extra work. Maybe you outfox somebody. Give me somebody that you look up and go, you know what? That was a that was a high five day in the room. Uh, I honestly, I'm gonna give you Marv Levy's answer. People say to him, Are you Marv doesn't have any any children or any sons? He's got a daughter stepdaughter and, and and people say to him are you sad that you didn't have a son and his answer was no i had close to a thousand sons during my career <laughs> right. and, and and i feel that way about virtually all the guys i drafted you know uh, uh i'm proud of what they've accomplished frank Reich turned out to be exactly what we thought he would be which was a, a great backup quarterback a great teammate a great person and now a great head coach uh, but uh, there, there's so many more, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't pick one. It would, it would be, I just can't, you know, it'd be like asking me, which of my children do I love best? <laughs> I bet though, I bet you love the process of it because it I is do. very. Oh, yeah. I miss the process at this time of year, being involved, knowing we're, we're, hit, we're sitting here talking about players. We don't know 40% of what the player's about. I, I couldn't wait to speak to the psychologist. I couldn't wait to speak to the college head coach. I couldn't wait to read the scouting reports. It's the process is just marvelous. It's, it, it, it's not a burden at all. There's no pressure. You're, you're, you're making your team better. It's the greatest thing in the world. The psychologist part. Did you guys have those way back 70s, 80s too? Yes. Yeah, well, 80s, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. We were the first, I think, to begin – uh, uh, systematized psychological testing in Buffalo. Wow. So you could tell leadership qualities or just talent? Yes. Everything. 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 And, and, and now 
there are any number of purveyors of tests and, and interview the processes and what have you that give you even more information, specific information about processing speed and, 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 and the ability to absorb and, and regurgitate knowledge and all those kinds of things that are so important to play in a position. You know, we talk about all the quarterbacks until the cows come home. As I say, we don't know 40, the, the most important 40%. Do they process? Are they poised? Can they regurgitate information? Can they handle pressure? We, we, you know, intellectual pressure, which is which is what blitzes and those things are all about. You know, the media, and we shouldn't know, but that's the most important information. Bill, is always an absolute pleasure. You got a podcast, don't you? I do. What is it called? Inside Football with Bill Paul. There you go. Bill, I love it. I get smarter every time. Thank you, sir. My pleasure, buddy. Always great to be with you.